This is Football Night in America, served by Applebee's. All right, we're here to chat about Sunday number two in the NFL season. Mike Tirico, Tony Dungy around the table with Mike Florio and Rodney Harrison. So, guys, the Atlanta Falcons, 39 <laughs> points, no turnovers. Teams don't lose that game historically in the history of the league, and they did. It was a crazy Cowboys comeback. Rodney, uh, I'll go to you first. Which side do you want to weigh in on? I'm, I'm just going to focus on the Dallas Cowboys, and I got to give a lot of credit to head coach Mike McCarthy. Um, his team was down 29 to 10 at halftime and just never quit. You know, Dallas has a lot of talent on offense. Um, you can never count them out when, when they're down. I just thought they did a terrific job. Dak Prescott leading those guys, continuing to believe despite being down, and they fought their way back. So they have some issues on defense, but I like what I see on the offensive side of the ball. You know, so many people have said during this time, oh, you can't pay Dak Prescott. He's a game manager. Now, you saw it today, that leadership on the sideline. Hey, we're still in this. We can get this done. And 450 yards, three rushing touchdowns as part of that comeback for the Cowboys. Mike, this is going to be a tough one. This Atlanta team, we saw what happened at the end of last year. They got it back together. They bring everybody back. This is a really crushing way to lose a game that you had in your pocket a couple of times. And this just furthers a trend that we've seen for years, even predating Dan Quinn as head coach of the Falcons. Back to the Mike Smith years, they would blow leads in the postseason. This is just what they've become. And I think it be can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. They've been through it so many times. They feel it falling apart, and there's nothing they can do to stop it. And think about the fact that Mike McCarthy would have been the goat of all goats <laughs> yeah. for going for two. Right. When it was 39-30, you just go for one, and then you're down eight points. And to end up getting saved by that goofy bocce ball onside <laughs> kick. It's unbelievable. Crazy. I want to ask Tony something first, and Rodney, just as a player, how you would react. Analytics have become a much bigger part of the game. Fourth and one at your own 35, you go for it, things like that. There's, a, there's been a chart for a long time about when you go for two, but usually it's no-brainer at that point. Down nine, go for the one, save the game. But there is a theory that you have a better chance to win the game if you go for two there and make it a seven-point game. You, your feelings on the way things have evolved a little bit. I've, I've heard all the analytics. That one doesn't make sense to me because if you miss it, it's still a two-score game, and then the team that's ahead can play much more relaxed. They don't have to gamble. You make it a one-score game. I've got to make first downs. I've got to keep going. I think you put all the pressure on the team by getting it back to eight points. And Rodney is a player in Mike, the locker room. You, Mike, you heard from the coach. I don't, I don't have anything really to add to that, but it, it makes a lot of sense. If you go for one, yeah. then all of a sudden it's a one-score game. If you, if you go and for two and you don't make it, now all of a sudden it's a, a two-score game. I, I agree with Coach wholeheartedly. And you had said earlier, Rodney, just going back to the other side of this with Dak Prescott, like you see games like this in, in your mind, it, it's cementing that Dak should be that guy in Dallas, not just for now, not just for the franchise tag, like that they should lock him up long term as their franchise quarterback. Absolutely, Mike. And when you see him and you actually see him on the sideline, you never see a sense of panic. You see him always calm, communicating with his guys and not really worried about what's going on. I mean, he's really focused on what he has to do. I mean, I like Dak. I, I think yeah. they should just go ahead and pay him. You know, it was actually... Can I add one thing? Can yeah, I add no, one thing go ahead, here? Mike. Yeah, sure. The prime problem for the Cowboys with Dak Prescott, they have waited too long, and they keep waiting too long, and it gets more and more expensive the longer they wait. Mm -hmm. They should have swooped in the moment his third season ended and gotten him taken care of. They kept thinking he'll take a hometown discount, that Jerry Jones will throw his arm around him and talk him into why he should take whatever the Cowboys will pay. Mm -hmm. And Dak, to his credit, has never wavered. And so it keeps getting more and more expensive. They're going to franchise tag him next year, and it's going to cost $37.68 million, even if the salary cap drops to 175. That gives him even more leverage next year than he had this year, and they just keep waiting and waiting. At some point, the time's going to run out. Everybody's looking for a quarterback. You got a chance to lock a guy up. That's the one thing with Dallas, Absolutely. with with Dak. You know, by the way, he went out for a couple of plays, and Andy Dalton came in and actually had the team in position there as they were going down the field. It just strikes you when you see all the injuries. We'll get into that in a second. 
Dallas has a really solid backup situation if they need somebody to save a game or two to have an Andy Dalton come in and start start playoff games. No doubt about it. Andy Dalton is going to be a good insurance policy for them. All right, let's go to Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Rodney, they get the win in Tom's Tampa home debut. It was weird to see Brett Favre show up at the game. Brett Favre, who would beat Tampa Bay all the time when he was at Green Bay, showing up in a Bucks t-shirt. Yeah, he hates that stadium. Exactly. Why, why, why was he there? <laughs> it was weird. Rods, what did you see week two with your old teammate, Tom? Coach, you talked about it in the pregame show, and, you know, Bruce Arians really did a great job of tailoring that game plan to Tom Brady, what he likes to do, screen, screen passes, quick passes, um, passes to the running back. But I'm a little disappointed because he hasn't yet found that connection with the tight end. You saw him and Mike Evans um, really connect and, and just feel like they're in a comfortable place. I agree with you. That's the one thing that I expected to see that we haven't seen yet is Rob Gronkowski Gronk? being a factor. Yeah, right. That's the one guy he knows. He's yes. thrown to him, and they, they haven't hit it yet, but they, they will. And uh, he was much better with Mike Evans today on some adjustments. Mike Florian. Yeah, and let me tell you, Rob Gronkowski last week, when I watched that game back, when he caught a pass in the first half, he looked like he was running in mud. I think it's going to take him a while to get back to whatever his maximum is. And who knows what it is at this point after being out for a year and now on the wrong side of 30. But, look, the, the Buccaneers had to have this one. They started the season with their hardest game at New Orleans. They continue with arguably their easiest game at home against the rebuilding Panthers team. They had to have it. It was a little dicey for a while, but, it, you know, it's a win. And now they move forward, and Tom Brady's going to be a little more comfortable. He's going to be a little better, and everything is going to be easier for him as they get more and more of these games under their belts. You, you know how we're supposed to never ask a question we know the answer to? I'm going to violate that rule right now because I'm going to bring in Mike Florio for the next topic. Mike Florio, the team you're most I guess not feeling good about after two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, counselor, lawyers are supposed to ask questions when yes, they know exactly the answer. Right. And yes, you, you know the answer. I, here, here's my take on the Vikings. And we may have alluded to this last week, but I feel even more strongly about it now. When they won that game against the Saints in the postseason last year, that got all these guys paid. Kirk Cousins, Mike Zimmer, Rick Spielman, Dalvin Cook. I was a firm believer. All those guys entering the last year of the contracts, don't pay them. Make them go work for it. Make them chase the carrot. And now we've seen for two games now, and it's easy to say it's a crazy year. We don't have fans. It's a pandemic, and you've got extra job security. I just feel like there's this attitude organizationally of it's a scholarship year. That's the only way I can explain what I've seen because that's not Kirk Cousins. Remember we said after the playoff game, hey, Kirk Cousins un unlocking a new level now uh -huh. because he got the monkey off his back and he won a playoff game. And if anything, he's regressed unlike we've ever seen him regress before. Well, who's supposed to replace well, Stephon Diggs? Well, that's the thing. You talk about these guys got paid. The right. one guy who didn't get paid was Diggs, right. and they miss him tremendously. They don't have that down-the-field shot. They don't have the guy that's demanding the double coverage. And we see what Diggs is doing in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. uh, he's playing yeah. ball, and, and so and, and I think they missed that. Coach, you're right. They have no identity on offense. You look at Dalvin Cook and what they've done to him the last couple of weeks, it just seems like they're holding him back. They're not al allowing him just to be who he is and give him the ball. But also you talk about who is that number two receiver. I look at tight end Kyle Rudolph. He was, you know, restructured his contract, got paid in the offseason, and he's got two catches in two games. Wow. And that defense, which has been their hallmark under Mike Zimmer, it hasn't been dominant, especially up front yet. So we, we need to get them going as well. All right, easy not to feel, about, feel good about Minnesota after two weeks. I'm going to throw Philadelphia into the mix here. Philly was up 17-0 on Washington early. I go, okay, good. They're going to be good. Wentz here settled in. Healthy, good start to the season. And since then, they have really struggled, and the Rams had a big margin on them, if not for Cooper Cup fumbling a punt during that game, uh, that game could have been even more one-sided. Tony, are you worried about the Eagles? I am, because I don't think they're running the ball effectively. Their Super Bowl year, they had a great running attack. And then defensively, they, they just don't seem like they can stop anybody right now. Rodney? Yeah, I, I agree, Coach. I look at um, Carson Wentz and, you know, Doug Peterson just seems like he wants to the entire offense to go through 
Carson Wentz. And, you know, like you talked about, when they had success, they were running the football. And even when Miles Sanders came back after missing, running back Miles Sanders after missing last week, I thought they were going to get back to running the football. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't understand what Doug Peterson is doing. It's these offensive coordinators trying to put up numbers instead of trying to win football games. Mike, should we be worried about you know, Philly? Well, I, I, I think yes, but also let's not overlook the reality that the Rams have become a lot better than we thought they were going to be this year. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought they were going to fall off. Wade Phillips out as defensive coordinator. Brandon Cook's gone, their number one receiver. Todd Gurley cut loose after the Rams regretted the big contract they gave him. I thought they were going to regress. And they've done anything but. And to beat Dallas week one and then go across the country and win at Philadelphia, I, I think that, that one of the reasons we're concerned about Philly is because uh, we may have – overlooked the Rams. I know I did. Well, but you talk about the Rams. That, that begs the question, how good is the NFC East? Yeah, they, they Dallas go. and Philadelphia, who we thought were going to be dominant teams, have looked anything but. And Saquon Barkley with the Giants and his knee injury, you didn't expect much from the Giants anyway. That makes it even tougher. The Washington football team goes out to Arizona, loses to the Cardinals. Should we bring up the Cardinals again, Tony? Let's not talk about the Cardinals. <laughs> Nobody else. And we'll just keep that for our little secret here with the Cardinals. <laughs> we're, we're, we're both on the Cardinals here. But you, you're right. This NFC East, there's going to be time to regroup because it does look like there's going to be a super team in there. Uh, let's go speed round here, word association. I'm going to start with the Ravens. We'll go Tony, then Rodney, then Mr. Florio. Ravens, Tony. I don't know if this is a word, but I'm going to say <laughs> These guys are good. Yeah. Okay, they play defense, they blitz, they can cover, they run the ball out of a lot of different formations, and Lamar Jackson looks like a 10-year veteran back in the pocket. I, I'm, I'm excited for them. <laughs> I agree with you, Coach. I'd say physical, because if you can't stop them running a football and they got a bunch of different guys that are big and physical, and you, you add Lamar Jackson into that, they're very difficult to stop, and you can't beat them unless you stop them running the football, Mike. For you. My word is 14. It's 14 straight regular season wins for the Baltimore Ravens, wow. and they're going to have a test next week against the Chiefs. But, you know, last week John Harbaugh told me they didn't slam the door on 2019. They're embracing that they were 14-2 and two last year. They remember it. They're, they're talking about it because they want to do as well, if not better, this year. Best, best team I've seen so far yeah. the first couple of weeks. We don't give away anything for week two, but best so far. Josh Allen of the Bills, Tony, over 400 yards passing. Impressive. Uh, Josh it has taken that next step as well. His team believes in him, and his coaches believe in him. We, we saw today four-point lead, clock's running down. Maybe they'll just pound the ball. No, we'll go deep twice and let him deliver. Put the ball in his hands. Absolutely, Coach. I was, I was about to say trust, and that's exactly what you see mm -hmm. from the Buffalo Bills. They trust Josh Allen. I thought they were going to get conservative, run the football, try to milk time off the clock, but yet they're steady throwing down the field. Gunslinger. That's the word. I mean, he, you know, he's the gunslinger. He's becoming the guy. And when, when you look at that 2018 quarterback class with Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, and Lamar Jackson, Lamar Jackson, clearly the best of the bunch. We're waiting to see who number two is going to be. It looks like it's going to be Josh Allen. They've beaten the Jets and Miami. So you just pump the brakes there for the moment. However, in the AFC East, the New England Buffalo games are going to be really intriguing. And maybe those are the two best in that division. All right, Tony, you start Mitchell Trubisky, word association. Um, comeback. Last year, a little bit off, and you know how Chicago is. All I'm sure all he heard was, this guy can't do it. Glad we've got Nick Foles, but he has played good football the first two weeks, and I, I think he's getting that trust back from his team. I would say inconsistent. Um, you played last week, and he, for three quarters, he stunk. He played extremely well in the fourth quarter. And, you know, I just say he's so up and down. I don't know if you could trust him. I don't believe in Mitchell Trubisky. He's playing, he's playing solid right now, but I don't believe in him. My word is self-reflection, or as Chris Sims would say, self-reflection of himself. Uh, <laughs> Trubisky used that word, not self-reflection of himself, just self-reflection. When I talked to him after the game, when he found out that – the Bears had traded for Nick Foles, and it was an open competition. Mm -hmm. It was during the pandemic. There was nowhere to go. There was nothing to do. He spent a lot of time with his thoughts, asking himself, what do I want to be? Who do I want to be? And he resolved at that point to show his teammates and his coaches and himself that he could hold off Nick Foles and win that starting job. 
And he just sounded different when I talked to him. I've talked to him multiple times in the past. This is a mature, confident, self-assured guy. And and look, they could easily be 0-2. Right. They've got a lot exactly. to iron out. <laughs> but 2-0 and goes a long way toward giving you some swagger going into week three. It's one of those weird things because like the folks in Chicago, when they saw that the opening night game, the kickoff game on NBC, was Houston against Kansas City. Oh, gosh, it's Mahomes against Deshaun Watson. You're just doing don't, that to make us feel don't worse, Don't remind right? us. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's go to Justin Herbert, who got the start for the Chargers because of the issue with the chest pains with Tyrod Taylor. And Herbert threw for over 300 yards, Tony. Word I'm association. Gonna, I'm going to say poise. Mm -hmm. uh, playing against Patrick Mahomes, first start, and it happened quick. It wasn't like, hey, all week I know I'm starting. I find out 20 minutes before the game. And he played. He didn't make mistakes. He used his feet. He made one bad throw, and, and that hurt him. But I thought he played very, very well. I would say the time is now, and that's a phrase. <laughs> the time is now. I mean, you're not going anywhere with Tyrod Taylor. But that guy stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Patrick Mahomes. Like you talked about, Coach, he made that one critical mistake. But for a guy to come in in those type of circumstances and play as well as he played, he also showed a lot of athleticism, Mike Florio. For the guy who replaced Tyrod Taylor, my word is Sean Taylor because the way that Justin Herbert blew that Chiefs linebacker up on the <laughs> sideline, it reminded me of the way Sean Taylor hit the punter in the Pro Bowl all those years ago. Yeah, yeah. Hey. I think I'm not sure because you want to, after you see that, say, okay, he's ready now. But the Chargers look pretty good. So that's such a yeah. tough situation they're and, in right now. And Tony. he's not ready now, but he is your future. And I, so I do, you, say, do you throw put, him in? Put him in there. Really? Yeah. And, yeah. and the way he played today it even proves to me even more. He deserves to be in there. He's not going to play at that level every week, but he'll get better and better. And this is a great kid. I'm, I'm telling you that. Yeah, you've met him. You know him out in Eugene. We were on the set here. We watched. There was a third down play late when he could have forced it and thrown it to the end zone. Nothing was open. He lived to see another day late in the game and not turn it over, trying to win the game, be a hero. That was a lot of poise. All right, last one. Aaron Jones, Packers, Tony. Mr. Packer right now. Mm. It, it used to be Aaron Rodgers, but he goes outside. He makes great catches in the passing game. He's running inside. He's got the home run speed, and he he makes their offense go. I would say MVP of their team right now. Um, he does everything. I mean, just to be able to line him up, take him out of the backfield, and line him up as a wide receiver against safeties and linebackers, he is just such a great athlete and a, a terrific receiver out of the backfield. I'm going with Tony's old group from the 70s, the OJs. Money, 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 money. <laughs> pay this guy. It's time to pay him. All these other running backs have got their contracts, and Aaron Jones doesn't have doesn't have his. And I, and I, I asked him about that today, and he laughed after he had 236 total yards from scrimmage and three right. touchdowns. I think I need to go call my agent, he said. Packers, Saints, Sunday Night Football, the Monday Nighter next week, the two best teams in the AFC, Chiefs and Ravens. They had some great primetime games week three of the NFL season. That's week two, and to wrap up on a Sunday, thank you, Mr. Florio. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. You guys safe home. Oh, wait, well, you are home. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you back in your home next week. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.